Hi, everyone. This is the last lecture um, of the PHS 1691 Biostatistics 2 in the spring 2020 semester. And the topic is survival analysis and the Cox regression. You see outline. So I will briefly talk about uh, the descriptive analysis in survival data. Uh, so it's basically include two parts, life table uh, to estimate the survival curve and also the Kaplan-Meier estimation for a survival curve or the cumulated uh, uh, incidence estimation. Um, and then to briefly talk about the uh, univariate uh, survival analysis, uh, basically from the log rank test. So the univariate analysis means um, you only have uh, one variable to be tested in terms of the time to event. So for example, you can compare two groups, for example, between male and female, you want to know if there's any difference between, uh, if any difference in their survival curves uh, between uh, male and female, then you can use a log rank test. Uh, so lastly, I will uh, talk about the regression model. Um, so I will give uh, the most commonly used model called the Cox Proportional Hazards Model, or the short name is PH. Um, so this is regression model to analyze the time to event data. So in a survival model, not only you can include the, uh, the exposure variable, can be either uh, continuous or categorical or binary, um, and also you can have uh, covariates, what we call the uh, uh, variables to be adjusted for. Um, so this is uh, the key difference between the uh, regression model and this univariate survival analysis through a log rank test. And lastly, I will give uh, uh, one example uh, uh, in SAS. So to demonstrate how you can use the SAS procedures to do some basic uh, survival analysis. Right. So the goals of the uh, survival analysis include the, the three following uh, items. The first one is to describe the time to event data for one group. So this can be from a life table or Kaplan-Meier curve, or to compare the time to event data between groups. Um, and basically this can be from a log rank test and also can be from other tasks, but log rank test is the most commonly used uh, to compare the time to event uh, between groups. And then lastly, model the event time data with the predictor variables. So this is called a survival model. So basically it's include a Cox proportional hazards model, accelerated filter time model, and also the proportional odds model. But in this class, um, I'll only talk about the uh, uh, Cox proportional hazards model. Here are the settings and notations. Um, so uh, the goal is to describe the survival data or time to event data, and then the event time for each subject i. And i can be from one to the big N, where big N is the sample size. But for each individual subject in the data, uh, so what we observed is called X. So the X is the minimum of T and C. So I will give the notation later on. Um, and then another thing we can estimate, or what we can observe is the uh, event indicator. Uh, we use notation uh, delta I. And delta I is an indicator function or dummy variable. Um, and within the dummy variable is a logic argument um, to see if ti is less than or equal to ci. And then we can see what is a ti, what is a ci. Um, pi is the actual time of event, but not always be observable. So for example, if we want to look at the time to mortality for a group of patients um, diagnosed with certain disease, and if you see that subject died from the time of enrollment, or we call the baseline, until the time of mortality, and you actually observed that time, if you observe a death event, 
and therefore this ti will be the actual observed uh, time to mortality but however you may not observe every single subject's time until they die um, so some of them will use the sensor time <coughs> excuse me what is the sensor time well that is the time observed if the patient was loss of follow-up um, usually we will deal with the right censoring so that means since the time is from left to the to the right so that means we have a clearly defined uh, starting time or we call the baseline time or we call time zero um, but we may not have a time if you if your time goes from left to the right um, and at some point we may loss a follow-up of this specific subject for example the, the subject may quit the study without noticing you um, or at the end of the follow-up you may not observe an event so for example you can only your study can only afford to follow up the subject for five years but at the end of the five year there still be a lot of subject uh, who have not died who still in the data set and this five years is not the time until mortality. However, this is we call the censoring time because at the end of five years, this subject is still in the data set, what we call still in the risk of set. It's still subject to the risk of death. And therefore, the five year we call the CI equal to five year, and that CI is called the censoring time. All right. So I give this two cases. The first case we call loss of follow-up. Um, so in case that subject quit a study, you won't be able to follow them up. You cannot get any information. Um, but if you see the subject still in the study at the end of your follow-up, and this is called administrative censoring. Um, so administrative censoring is specific refers to uh, the situation that at the end of the study or at the end of the follow-up time, uh, you still cannot observe an event for that subject. Right? The event is uh, defined based on the study. So for example, if the event is defined as mortality, um, if the subject is still in the data set without death, in that five years, at the end of that five-year follow-up is the time for the administrative sensory. We call it end meter censoring time. All right, and then we still have its other notations which can help you uh, to understand uh, later on we have the estimate of the survival curve. So I'm going to use the big F of T to indicate a cumulative incidence function at time T. So this is very similar to uh, the uh, cumulative density. So if you have had the uh, uh, introduction to statistic and probability. So we usually use the big F to denote the cumulative density. And there's a similar idea here. So um, you will observe the incidence uh, in the B cohort and the probability at a certain time T, the cumulative incidence is uh, notated by this F of T. So survival function is um, actually related to this cumulative density function um, and uh, the, the whole the entire uh, distribution of the uh, event time is actually have a hundred percent and if you see f of t at time t so 100 percent minus f of t will be the s of t so which is the uh, survival function at the curve so that's basically since saying this is the on the left hand side of a uh, time t ender that cumulative density curve but this is on the right hand side and the sum between the sum over f of t and s of t will be equal to 100 percent so this is easy to understand actually in reality um, so you have a big cohort and follow them up and at certain time point t so for example 30 percent of the subject die um, and then you still have 70% left over. So that 70% will be the survival function. 
and that 30% will be the cumulative instance. Um, and this uh, little lambda t is the hazard rate at time t. So the hazard rate is a, a concept of rate. So this is basically to say at a specific time t, the change of the, uh, the instance. So, how, so, so this basically um, to indicate if the risk or the hazard is large or small. And this big lambda of t, we call the cumulative hazard function of t. So it's basically sum over the little lambda t from time zero up until the time little t. Okay, and here I give uh, uh, two typical observer right sensor data, so you'll be able to understand uh, how this, uh, uh, how we actually use this data in reality or in the typical uh, survival data. So on the left hand side is the uh, study setup. So it's more likely to have, to indicate the actual uh, collection of the data or the actual uh, observation um, based on the study design. So for example, the first subject, you actually uh, start enroll that first subject in year 1990 and you follow them up all the way until 2000 and you assume your study can follow them up for 10 years and at the end of 2000 which is the end of the study you still did not see an event time so here i basically use the uh, the cross to represent an event and use this dot to represent the sensor so that means at the end of the follow-up, you still didn't see an event. So this event can either be a mortality or maybe a diagnosis of certain disease in medical uh, studies. Um, so if we use mortality as the event, that means you follow them up, um, but they didn't, uh, that specific subset uh, did not die at the end of study. So the 10 years, so if you move from the actual calendar year, to the time of survival analysis. And then basically what you see is you see a 10 years follow up. But remember, this is the 10 year is not an event time, it's a censoring time because at the end of the 10 years, you didn't see an event. Um, and the patient get at the main treatable censored um, at the end of the study. So the second case um, is an event because you see a cross. Um, and that means you may enroll that patient since year 1991. But um, at the end of, we say, uh, before 1995, because this, this line is 1995, but somewhere between 1994 and 1995, the subject died. And then you can calculate the time to event because you're starting from 1991 and let's say this is middle year of 1994. Um, and what you got is 3.5 years. And that 3.5 years will be an event time. So that means the second subject, what you observed is the TI, the event time, which is equal to 3.5. But the first subject, what you observed is CI, which is equal to uh, 10 years. So remember CI indicate the time to censoring or the censoring time. So similarly, you can follow them up for all of this, uh, um, we thought these nice subjects, and then you can transcript this actual observation on the left-hand side to the usable uh, time to event data. So on the right-hand side will be the data set we're going to use, um, because uh, what we need is um, the time to either survival, uh, the time to either event or censoring, and then the indicator um, whether this is a censoring time or event time. Um, and if you go back to the previous page, you can see um, what we observed is the xi and the delta i, and the delta xi is basically the length. Uh, so in whatever subject we have here, the length actually indicate 
uh, the xi. So that will be the minimum of ci and pi. So if you are ti, you actually um, observe as a cross. But if you have the ci means, that means at this time, you haven't observed it then. So that has to be a ci. So in terms of delta, so this will be equal to one, this will be equal to one because they're event, and this is equal to one, one, and one, and one. And this uh, ID number one and ID number four will have a delta equal to zero because uh, what you observed is a CI. So that means TLS and CI does not hold here uh, because the CI, the censoring time, is actually less than TI. And therefore, you don't have a one, so you have a zero for that indicator. All right, so uh, what we do observe, uh, and also the key concept here is through the risk set. Um, that's, the, that's a very important thing in survival analysis. So because in reality, the, every single subject who should have their own TI or CI, but actually in the data, we observe the X and Delta and X is the actual time it observed. So it can be either censoring time or event time. And the other thing we can observe is this delta. And you can think about that. So for example, each specific subject, if we plot this um, in terms of a uh, two-dimensional curve, and the X axis uh, including uh, indicated failure time, or we call the event time, uh, big TI, and then the y-axis indicate the censoring time, ci. So if we assume every single subject will have his or her own ti and the ci, and that can be represented by this dot. So for example, uh, for the censoring things, so if we have this dot right here, these are the actually censoring time you observe. And this cross will be the, uh, the event you actually observe right there. Um, and then um, the, the thing is, if this, each individual subject has a CI and TI, we can, uh, it can fully specify the XI and the delta I, which is what we observed. But however, is the other way around still hold? The answer is no. Um, so if you observe the XI and the delta I, that means at a specific time point, you know this is a event time or sensory time. You cannot fully specify each individual's sensory time C and each individual's event time T because there are too many possibilities. So the answer is not unique. The thing is, on this way, if you, if you fully specify TI and CI, you can only have a unique answer for XI and delta I. Um, and the risk set is defined as the, uh, at a specific time point we call little t. Um, the risk set will be the set for the subject with their big T greater than little t. Remember, big T indicate his or her uh, event time. And also his or her C, which means the uh, censoring time for that specific individual will also need to be greater than T. So this T out two situations. One situation is if the subject failed, uh, if the subject failed before time TI, that means the TI, big TI less than or equal to the little t. Uh, so here's the little t. If you die before this time, you are not in the risk set because you're not facing the risk anymore. Uh, you'll be teased out from the risk set. Um, the other situation is if your censoring time is less than TI. Um, so that means uh, you get censored um, before this little t. And at little t, we do not know your specific status. You can either die or still alive. Um, but the thing is, we have no idea. Um, because you get censored before even entering this little t, which is a ton of interest. Um, and in that situation, you are, you're not in the risk set either, um, because there's two possibilities. You may die or not, but we just do not know. All right, and um, 
Um, one way we can do the estimation of the survival is called life table. So life table is uh, uh, basically very uh, a simple from uh, a table. Uh, so here I give the data example, um, which we use the life table. So for example, um, so life table refers to divide your full up time into a specific range. So in the previous uh, um, example, because we follow up until year 10. So we follow them up for 10 years. And then you can divide into 10 different intervals. Uh, so for example, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, all the way up this 10 interval. And for that 10 interval, in order to estimate the uh, survival function, so what you need to know is the number of alive at the beginning. Um, and also the number of deaths within this time range. And also the number of censored within the time range. So for this, for instance, in this uh, specific example, uh, we're starting with 146 subjects. So that's the total number of subjects we enrolled. Uh, and we we'll start following them up. And within year one, we observed 27 deaths with the three censorings. Um, and then for the other time range, which is from the next law, uh, one year to two year, um, you, start, you start from uh, 116 because you, 30 of them will be removed out of the risk set. So within the risk set, you're actually starting from 116. And if you observe 18 deaths and 10 censoring, uh, and that's the number you need to use, and also you can get the uh, starting number for the next time slot, so which is 118, 116 uh, minus 18 minus 10, which is 88, et cetera. And we can all the way record this number at the end of the follow-up. So for example, at the end, uh, the last range, we're starting with eight specific subjects. So that's the leftover um, until year 10 of the follow-up. And in that last range, uh, we'll have two died and six censored. So remember this six censored can be either loss of follow-up within this range, or it could be rose uh, get at means a treaty with censored, which means uh, at end of the year 10, uh, still haven't, uh, still didn't die at the time, still alive at the end of the, uh, the study follow-up. Uh, so that could be another, um, possibility of censoring. And then um, the question here is how we can estimate a five-year mortality rate where we use this uh, X of five um, equal to the probability that uh, the observed or the probability the random variable of event time is greater than or equal to five. Um, so that's basically um, the rate um, of still alive um, at year five. Um, so the naive estimate is you can go back to this table and see year five, you put the line here and you do a quick calculation. Uh, and you can see if you sum up over the deaths, the deaths equal to 76. So that means within um, the five years, you did observe 76 deaths uh, from your study follow-up but you're starting from 164. And therefore, a very naive estimate is you use the number of deaths within the year range um, from zero to five years, divided by the total number of observations um, from the uh, uh, study cohort, so which is also the uh, number of subjects at the starting time. Um, so a very naive analysis um, so will give you 52.1%. So that means the death rate, mortality rate will be 52.1%. And the survival rate will be one minus, so 100% minus this, so which is equal to 74.9%. Um, so this basic saying 70, 47.9% say they alive um, at the end of the five year follow up. Um, but is this correct? Maybe, maybe not. Why? The reason is um, this method actually ignore the censorings. 
So if you do not have censoring, so everybody does, like say, all you observe is the death. There's no observation for censoring. And this will be the correct way, right? Because you're only looking at the death. The thing is, here, you see there's still 29 get censored. Um, and this 29 get censored will be questionable um, at the end of year five. Why? The reason is, before year five, you did say 29 of them get censored. But you do not know at the end of year five, would this 29 subject, what died with this 29 subject was still alive? It could be either way, right? So some of them could be die. So even though like say, if you get very early censored, um, even though it's out of study, but because they still ended the risk, and some of them may still end at a high risk. Um, and therefore, they may die at the end of year five. But some of them may still alive. The reason is you cannot differentiate among these 29 who get died, who's still alive. In other words, you don't know how many subjects among these 29 still alive and how many of them died at the time. So if you really know that number, you can easily calculate, right? Because you can like say, if you know that and you just put number of deaths into the 76, that will increase your numerator. Um, and then if they didn't die, and you can still keep in alive, and then that will increase the number of the denominator for the calculation. Um, and therefore, um, as we see, there's two kinds of naive analysis. So one is you assume all of these 29, the first, the first calculation is equivalent to you assume all of these 29 still alive at the end of the study. And therefore you put them into the denominator. Um, and the other is you assume this 29 um, will be the subject who died or and that will decrease the number of denominators. Therefore, the denominator will be 1 to 46 minus 29, and you will have an estimate around 65% for the, uh, the rate of death, and we should lead to a 35% survival. And you can see if you use, if you use um, I mean, this will be the two extremes. So if you use these two extremes of naive analysis, there will be a huge range for the estimation. So the estimate of survival could range from 35% to 47.9%, which is a big range. Um, so it could be any number within that uh, based on the assumption. Um, the reason is, the, the reason we call this a naive analysis is either we assume all of these 29 um, may die, or we'll just say that all of the 29 is still alive. Okay. And uh, the live table estimate can be, uh, um, can be used to handle that situation. Uh, so which means uh, we will not use naive analysis anymore, um, but based on the live table analysis, we actually take care of the censoring at each time range uh, before year five, because we are going to look at the five year survival rate. Uh, and the things, the way to do that is for every single uh, time point, uh, or every single time slots, um, we get this data, we actually handle that situation. So for example, uh, for the first range, from year zero to year one. We're starting with 146 subjects, and we see 27 deaths, and three get the withdrawal, what we call censoring. We use a W to indicate the, uh, to indicate the number of censoring or withdrawal. Um, and if you first, what you calculate is the, uh, the death rate within that range. So the death rate is basically using the number of deaths divided by the starting number. Uh, that means the number of subjects in the risk set. So in that situation, that would be 27 over 146. 
uh, which is equal to 0.185. And therefore, uh, we can say within this specific period, the, uh, the survival rate is equal to 81.5%. And we use this notation as had, uh, use a, a superscript R to indicate the ending point uh, or the ending time point. Um, and then at the, uh, this is basically a, a product of all the uh, probability um, of survival within each year. But the way to do that is to actually adjust for the censoring by doing the production, doing the products uh, of each range of time point. Um, and then you can see better uh, in the second time range. So that's the year one to two. And then here it will start from 116 uh, subjects um, in the risk of set, and 18 of them die and 10 withdraw. And this way, uh, you will have the specific survival rate within that range, uh, year one to two. So this is equal to 18 divided by 116, so which is equal to 0.155. And what you get the survival within that specific time range is um, 0.845. And then at the end of year two, the cumulative survival based on the life table is equal to the product of the two survival rate in the previous time range. So here you can see we, we subdivide this 10 range into two parts because you get the finer data. Um, so the data is, is finer because if you all the way follow them up to big range, and then um, you will only have a starting number, ending number, and there's a lot of things happening, uh, a lot of things going on within this time period, and, but you cannot differentiate. If, if you get the time range is a finer and finer, you have more and more range, you can get this more and more accurate because at the end of that time period, you can always use the product of survival um, as the estimate of survival um, until the end of this time period. Um, so this is obvious. Um, so you can think about like uh, the survival, the cumulative survival is actually the survival in this time range and times the previous history of survival. Because at each time, each time range, you'll be people die, people are still alive. So the cumulative of the life will be a better estimate of the alive with the reference of the starting time point, right? You're starting from certain time point, um, but if you just want to compare the end of this time period with the starting time period, um, the ending time of this period with the starting time of the time of the same time period. So the survival is basically equal to this. So similarly, you can, if you go all the way up until year, the end of year five, you will have this more accurate estimation of the survival time. So here we call it the uh, life table estimate of survival time. And then you can see we got the estimate equal to uh, 0.432, so which is basically within the range of this too naive analysis. Right, because this is uh, too rough, uh, so it's from 35% to 37% in this 43.2% um, is a uh, better, you can see it's within this range, but it gives you a more accurate estimate, a more accurate point estimate um, of the survival rate. Okay, um, so that's the, the first uh, method for the life table estimate. And, and this we call it assume censoring occurred at the right end of the survival. So which means uh, because we have a relatively long follow-up period. And if you, uh, if you observe this number of uh, censoring, you have no idea where exactly they get censored. You only, what you only know is, uh, is, the, is the range of the get sensor. So let's say you may need to, you, you may know to get 10 of them get censored between year one and two, but you don't know is that year 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. 1 
So the first one is assume all of these 10 get censored at the end of the interval. Um, and this way, you actually can basically put this uh, number of censored in the risk set, so which means they are in the denominator all the time of this full up period, right? Make sense? So you see, the reason is the way to calculate the uh, uh, mortality rate, Q of R in that range, is we use a formula like this. We use a number of uh, deaths within the range divided by the number of starting number. So that means all of this number um, will get uh, observed up until the end of the time period. So which means the number of censored should be in the denominator all the time. So the second way is to assume that censoring occurred uh, immediately right to the left end of the interval. So that means right after the starting time of that time period, uh, this number gets censored. So therefore, you will have another way to estimate the, the rate of mortality. So this is basically equal to D, the number of deaths, divided by N minus W. Because this number W is teased out from the rich set right after the uh, follow-up time period. So that means uh, for the whole year follow-up, this W number of censored will not be included in the risk set as the denominator. And therefore the denominator will have N minus W. And similarly, you use this formula, you can, ca you can also calculate the estimated uh, survival percent, and then the product of the survival will be the cumulative ones. Um, and this way, uh, we can have another estimate. You can see we can have the survival estimate, which is around 40%. Um, the previous one, remember, is 43%. Um, so the reason this is less than the previous estimate is because you will have a smaller denominator because you tease out the, the censoring. So if the censoring happened earlier, um, the survival rate is actually lower because the, uh, the mortality rate will be higher because you're looking at, you still have the same number of uh, of death, but this is among a smaller number of cohort, and therefore the proportion will be larger, um, and therefore the uh, uh, the survival will be smaller. And this is the reason you'll see a smaller number of uh, uh, survival rate uh, if you compare this way uh, with the way you assume that uh, the sensor occurred at the end of the interval. All right. And uh, the third one is most commonly used is we assume that half of censoring occur immediately prior to the left end of interval, and the other half of the censoring occurred at the right end of the interval. So this is equivalent to you assume uh, all of this number of uh, censoring as censored in the middle year which is mean, mean the middle time of the time range. So for example, you assume that three of the uh, censorings will occur at half a year, and this 10 at 1.5 year, and this has a 2.5 years, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is, this is equivalent. And, and the, the way to do that is we tease out a half of the Ws, well that means half of the censorings, from the risk of set or the denominator. And therefore, your denominator will be, become M minus um, one half of the W. And this is the other way to adjust for this estimate. And then you can see this number should be between the previous two estimate, right? Because the previous one, one of them you use N, the other one you use M minus W. So you use M minus one half of W, you will have an estimate between the previous two estimates. Um, so using this method, what you got five year 
survival rate is 41.7%, uh, 0.47417. And you can see this number is between this 0.4 and 0.432 is it's almost in the middle of them. Because in the middle, that will be four, uh, 0.416. So this is 0.417. All right, and here is the, uh, um, the plot where the uh, graphic display uh, of the survival function by the live table method. So it's basically, uh, you will have a range, you have a pre-specified range for the observation. So range cannot be so fine or cannot be so rough. If it's too rough, you will not have an estimate. But if it's too fine, you may not afford to do the observations because you have to follow them up very intensively. Um, and this is an example using one year as the time range for the observation. And therefore you'll be able to uh, update the survival at the end of the follow-up time. Like say you have the update of the survival rate at year one and they have year two, year three, year four, and year five, something like that. And, and therefore, you will not just have one estimate from year one to five, but you will have like a, a four, uh, five different legs uh, for that 10 range. Um, so you update the estimate at the uh, end of the observation. So for example, at the end of year three or year 3.1, you have some median uh, survival. So median survival is defined as the survival time uh, for that 50% of the uh, 50 50 percent of the subjects get the event, so you can basically find 50% on the y-axis, which is the survival rate. And then you can get the corresponding estimate um, of the uh, the time. And here we assume that uh, if you do not have the uh, estimate uh, within the time range. So we assume uh, the survival uh, decrease gradually, or it's linearly within that time range. So this is similar to interpolation of the data, just linear interpolation of the data. So that's the uh, uh, life table estimate. All right, so here I have one example in this data, but I'm not going to show that. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can put this into uh, SAS data and you can use the SAS life table to do that. But my example here is actually a stable example. Um, and again, I'm not going to uh, uh, go over the detail, but here I just want to show you what the uh, life table estimate looks like. So basically you have this time range. Right, it's starting from certain time range. Um, so if you do not have any event occurred, so that range will be ignored. So here you're starting from time range 143 to 144 is because um, there's no event before one, 143. So in that range, you starting with this number and then the number of deaths and the number of loss of follow up. And then you have survival estimate and uh, I believe uh, Stata will use the uh, method assuming the censoring occurred at the middle of the time range, or you assume half of them at the beginning, half of them at the end, uh, which is equivalent. Um, and then you have this, basically you see the survival for each range um, times the survival for the previous time range, you'll get this cumulative survival. Um, and therefore, this time life table will give you the estimate of survival at each end of the time range. Um, and also, you can calculate the standard error and 95% confidence interval for that survival rate. All right, so that's the life table analysis. Um, so the other um, methodology um, we use to estimate the survival curve is called the Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is the uh, method being proposed by Kaplan and Meyer. Um, and this is also related to a previously proposed estimation called Nelson Allen estimation. Um, but the idea of the uh, Kaplan-Meier analysis is as follows. So again, we can have this, uh, this graphical display of the risk set. 
and we have observed the data. Um, the sensor is um, represented by the dots and the uh, um, the the cross or the the red cross uh, is the the failures the time the failure time event time and the the circle uh, blue circle is the sensor time and if you combine them then we can have a mixture of the total ops which is a total ops which is actually observed is a mixture at the sensor time and event time. Um, so the idea of Kaplan-Meier is at each uh, failure time from T1, T2, all the way to Tk. So remember, we observe, we estimate them only at the, uh, the time of failure. So if there's, if a specific time we don't have any event of failure, we'll ignore that time um, and assume this time will have the same estimate as the previous time form. So whenever you have a, a event time being observed, we call this 10 T1 to Tk. Um, and the T0 is always the time zero. And the Tk plus one, and k is the last number of observations. But over the last one, you see the last one plus one is equal to infinity. Because you cannot observe a time after the last uh, event time. So we'll just automatically assume that the next event time will be time infinity. Um, so the way to do that is um, we can calculate there's an n little j or n sub j number of at risk immediately before the time tj. Okay, the tj is a specific time point being evaluated. And also we know uh, D sub J number of subjects will fail at the time TJ. And the M sub J will get censored between the time range TJ to the next event time TJ plus one, All right? So remember these T's uh, are also only the failure time or event time. This will not include the censoring time. So we're not counting the center, we'll only count the time of event. Um, and then the Kevin Meyer estimate is uh, estimated through uh, multiple processes. Um, the first process we call the counting process. So the counting process actually count the number of event at a specific time point tj, um, sorry, t, a little t. So we use without tj. So we just use a little t. Now the little t is a specific time point. It's not a random variable time, but it's a specific realization of the time point. So we count the number of xi less than t and delta equal to one. So remember what this delta means. So delta means um, the ti less than ci. So delta one equal to one means that Xi is actually a observation of event. So if the observation of event is less than the pre-specified time point T, so that means before time point T, this subject had the failure. And therefore at the time point T, this will be counted as one event. So basically the NJ will count um, if a specific, uh, I'm sorry, the n sub i t will count for each subject i, so whether this subject i is an event uh, with respect t to time t. All right, so if this is an event and that's equal to one, or if that subject uh, still um, not have an event at 10 t. So that could mean this xi greater than t, or this delta equal to zero. So if delta equal to zero, um, and you know at this specific time point, this is a sensor. And therefore you have no idea if it's a, 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 a confirmed case or not. Um, so this ni, ni uh, in sub i t will only count the confirmed cases. Um, within the time range zero to little t. So that means before time little t, uh, if each individual or each observation or each subject is a failure or not a failure. 
Okay, so if we sum over this NIT, and we, what we got is called this NT. So the NT will be the total number of events prior to the time little d, right? Because this will sum over. Like say, if you I from one to 1,000, and then this will see, will count all the 1,000. Like say, among this 1,000, maybe uh, 500 of them get the uh, failure between the time little t. And then this ni, uh, big nt will equal to 500. And this little nt is just one and zero, indicating each individual's uh, failure uh, status. Okay, and the other risk we call it is the uh, at-risk process. So the at-risk process for each individual i is denoted by y sub little i at time t. So this is basically to evaluate if the observed time for that individual is a event or not uh, at the time little t. So Remember, if this x of i t greater than or equal to t, so that means both censoring time and event time will be greater than t, right? Because this little this x of i is equal to the minimum of t i and c i. So if the minimum of t i and c i is greater than t, that means the other one is automatically have a value greater than or equal to t. And therefore, both TI and the CI, both event time and censoring time, were greater than TI. So that means uh, we can confirm this individual is in the risk set um, at the starting time point. And therefore, this is a, also an indicator variable zero and one. And if you event, if you x of t less than t, you are not in the risk set. But if your x is greater than or equal to t, you will be in the risk set at the time point t. All right? And if we sum over that ti, similarly to a uh, sum over of this, and what we got is actually uh, a big y of t equal to the summation. So that will give you the total number of count of the at risk. So that means at each time point, little t, you can count the number of failures before this time. And you can also count the number of at risk right at this time point t. Um, and then the Kevin Meyer estimate is um, proposed as the product uh, from each time point um, before the time of evaluation little t. Um, and that means we actually looking at every single possible time range uh, with the difference of the, uh, um, the failures. So whenever you have a previous failure times and then between those failure time, you will evaluate the survival as one minus the di n over ni. And the di is the counting process or the count of number of failures n i and uh, um, and this little n j is the summation of all the at risk or, or the total number of at risk at time t j so if you put the j here um, and if you do the uh, um, do the uh, the limit for that is actually equal to a product of the exponential of this part so this is actually a big game you can prove by the Taylor expansion of the exponential functions. So if you have this exponential function, if you do Taylor expansion, you basically you can have is this. Um, and this is actually equal to because the product uh, for the exponential function is equivalent to the exponential function to the summation of that. So this is basically be uh, simplified to an exponential function which is the e to the power of a summation for all of this dj over nj. And this part is actually been proposed before Kaplan Meyer by Nelson and Allen. So this part is called a Nelson Allen estimate. So Nelson Allen estimate is actually um, an estimate of the log or the negative of the log of the survival function. 
um, and the carbon bar is driving the estimate of the uh, of the estimator for the survival function, but they end up to be equivalent. Um, because both of them propose uh, a different thing to estimate this. Um, one is estimate the, the log of that part is actually, um, we call this uh, a hazard function. So this is proposed by Nelson Allen as the hazard rate with a cumulative hazard because the summation will be the cumulative hazard. Um, and this end up to be the survival function is equal to exponential uh, of the negative of the cumulative hazard. So the estimation of the cumulative hazard is a Nelson Allen estimator. And uh, the survival or the exponential of that cumulative, uh, negative of the cumulative hazard function um, is called uh, Kaplan Meyer estimate. All right, so we introduced that um, Kaplan Meyer estimate, the uh, life table. Um, and next one I want to introduce is the, uh, uh, the regression model for survival time. And this is a most commonly used ones. There are multiple survival functions being proposed and used in real research, but the Cox model is the most commonly used. And the goal of the Cox model is to study the association between covariates and time to event outcomes. And the covariates can be time dependent covariates or not time dependent and your outcome will be the sensor event time. So the sensor event time will be a combination uh, of the sensor in time and the event time through the observation of the minimum of TI and CI, and those are the indicator of uh, a sensor versus an uh, event. So this is really a breakthrough in statistics, um, and um, the PADO 1972 comments on this to say because um, Cox 1972, because he is Cox, has opened up new territory to common sense. Um, and this is the uh, specification um, of the Cox proportional hazards model. Um, and we call this a semi parametric pro uh, proportional hazards model. And basically, uh, Cox proposed is not the direct estimation of the time t. Uh, and also is not the estimation of the survival function of the, but instead he proposed to model this in terms of the hazard function. Uh, and the hazard function is given by a little lambda of t given z. So this is a hazard function for a covariate z, where this z can be a vector of the covariates as well. Um, so if z is a vector of the covariates, um, so that's going to be from z1 to zp. So that means we have a, a total number of p covariates or predictor variables um, in the regression model. Um, and uh, it model it through two parts. So one part is the exponential function of the linear combination of the covariates. So the effects of each covariates will be additive on the exponential scale. And therefore, on the original scale, that will be not additive. That will be multiplicative because the summation, um, exponential function of the summation is equal to the product of all the exponential function. And therefore, um, that will be multiplicative instead of the additive scale. Um, and then the other part is we call this lambda zero t. So this is the n-specified baseline hazard function at time t, non-parametric, <coughs> excuse me, and also uh, with infinite dimensional. Infinite dimensional is because um, there are infinite number of little t. At each little t, you will have one estimation of this uh, baseline hazard uh, lambda zero. Uh, and the reason we call this baseline hazard is because this part, uh, lambda zero t, um, will replace the intercept. And you can see here with, within exponential function, there's no beta zero. We always from starting from beta one z one plus beta two z two plus zeta three p three all the way to plus beta p z p. And this part is similar to a beta zero, but this is more flexible than beta zero. If you have a beta zero here, that's a fix for all the time t. 
But if you tease out that lambda zero t, that means at different time point, you can have a different intercept for the baseline hazard function because they are changing over t. Um, and here you can think about that. Uh, the survival data have one more dimension than the uh, regular uh, independent data because the, like say if you do a linear regression, you don't have a dimension of time. But here we introduce another dimension, which is tiny. Tiny is an infinite number of dimensions because you have an infinite number of time point. Uh, and time is uh, continuous variables. And therefore, um, um, you could, so you could have at every single time point, you can have a flexible, um, um, be flexible, you can have a different number of this uh, baseline hazard at a different time point. Okay, so that's the setup and idea of the Cox model. So basically, it, it, will, it will just uh, estimate the hazard uh, for different value of covariance C um, at the time t through modeling the baseline hazard. So the baseline hazard can be considered as the hazard for all the covariance equal to zero. So that means if the covariance is a continuous variable, that means the continuous variable to take a value zero, when if this Z is a binary, that means the, the binary variable need to take the reference group or baseline. Uh, that means that variable can be equal to zero. All right, so as I said, if the Z covariate is a zero and one variable or binary variable, and then this uh, hazard, um, the hazard ratio um, or the Cox model can be uh, written as the, and also here we assume we only have one predictor variable Z, and that is the binary variable. And then the uh, Cox model can be written as the uh, lambda, which is the hazard function at t, and given z equal to one, which is as the uh, higher level, is equal to the lambda of t, z equal to zero, so which means the reference group. And this is the baseline hazard, lambda zero. Baseline hazard is basically just the hazard uh, at z equal to zero, times an exponential function of root beta. Remember here, we only have one predictor variable z, and therefore z is a zero and one, and therefore beta times one is just beta. So therefore this is equal to this part, is equal to this times an exponential function of beta. And you can see, we do a very simple math. We move this um, to the other, to the left hand side. And that means both left hand side and uh, right hand side divided by this lambda zero or lambda t at z equal to zero. And then you have a ratio on the left hand side, which is the ratio of uh, hazard at z equal to one versus z equal to zero and equal to e to the beta. So which means e to the beta is the hazard ratio between z equal to one and z equal to zero. And therefore beta is just the log of the hazard ratio comparing z equal to one with z equal to zero. And therefore we will have very meaningful interpretation of the parameter beta in the Cox proportional hazard model. And this is also a big benefit of using the Cox proportional hazards model because the interpretation will be so easy. Um, interpretation in terms of relative risk is when the risk is a cumulative distribution or hazard function. Um, so if this is accumulative, um, because you can always do an integration of the hazard little lambda, so the integration of the little lambda is basically equal to the big lambda, which is the cumulative. Because the cumulative is the idea of integration. So if you do integration on both hand side, and you can see the cumulative has a function uh, at time t for the group z equal to one will be equal to the cumulative has a function at time t for the group z equal to zero times the exponential function. The reason is if you do integration on both hand side and this e to the beta is a constant and therefore you can, you can factor out that constant and that constant didn't change. 
but uh, uh, both hand side will change to the cumulative hazard function. But if this beta is related to T, or there is a Z that is changing over T, and this we call the time dependent covariance or time dependent variables or time varied variables. And you cannot use it this way and you will not have a relationship like that. Um, and then you probably cannot use the cost model very easily to interpret that time dependent variables or time varied variables. But if the Z is not time dependent or beta is not time dependent, this is a good idea to just use the Cox proportional hazards model and we can easily either interpret the beta as the log of hazard ratio or log of the cumulative hazard functions. All right. Um, so again, we can do this interpretation in treatment effects. So if the beta Z represent a treatment, so Z equal to one uh, indicate a treatment, Z equal to zero indicate a, a placebo or standard of care. And if this beta greater than zero, so this means increase the hazard, uh, implies decrease the failure time. If beta go to zero, that means there's no treatment effect. Or if beta less than zero, so this indicates increase the hazards and also implies the increase the failure time. Okay, and here you basically, if you want to see if a new drug um, is uh, better than the uh, uh, the old drug or the uh, placebo, what you want to expect is you see a beta less than zero because beta less than zero means for that specific treatment, your hazard is smaller than the hazard for the previous drug. Or in other words, the time of survival for the subject using this treatment will be longer than the time for the subject using the old or the placebo. All right, um, and uh, from the uh, COPS model, uh, without the time varying covariate or without time dependent covariate, we can easily get the relationship between the two uh, functions uh, of uh, survival time. Um, so if we do a simple math, we know this cumulative, uh, as I said, the S of T, the uh, survival function is equal to the exponential uh, to the negative of this cumulative hazard function. So if we just do the simple math, and we can see the survival function at time T for the treatment group is equal to one, is equal to the survival function of and time t for the reference group z equal to zero to the exponential of the beta. So this is basically a, a exponential of the exponential. So the exponential of the beta is in the power uh, of the survival function. So it's basically beta will be within two exponential bars. Um, and also there's another alternative we call Lehman alternative. So the example is the survival function of t uh, at time z at the at time t for the z equal to zero is basically the the baseline of the reference group is equal to the exponential to the lambda t, which follow a exponential function with the parameter lambda, and you can see uh, for the the other group or the higher level of group z equal to one for the treatment group, um, the survival function is equal to this baseline e to the lambda, e to the negative lambda t, to the e to the beta. So basically, this is equal to e to the negative lambda times e to the beta times t, because this part, the power of an exponential function can go through the power of that part, is the product of the power. Um, and this is equal to another exponential function, but with another, uh, parameter, which is not lambda, but this parameter will become lambda times e to the beta. So which means um, in terms of the survival function or on the scale of the survival function, um, this cost model means the, uh, the 
the both of them were from exponential function, if it's from exponential function, but the higher level um, or treatment level will be equal to a, another exponential function with a parameter with the well, added, it's not an additive with a, a multiplicative parameter e to the beta. And this is the uh, another way to interpret that beta parameter. So there, the critical assumption is proportionality in time-dependent beta. So that means uh, no matter at which time uh, for the time t, because this time t is infinite dimensional, um, and then you always need to keep the proportionality um, between your group z equal to zero and the group equal to one, and they all equal to the exponential beta. So this is called proportionality. So the proportionality of the two survival curve um, where the exponential of the, is up until exponential power function. But if you look at the uh, proportionality as the um, hazard rate of the scale, Basically, that means this two hazard rate uh, over time has to be parallel up until constant e to the beta. And therefore, um, if there's a time interaction with the survival, can be uh, usually people can use the way to do is you see if the two curve will be crossed over. If the two two uh, the two uh, so uh, the two uh, hazard rate curve will cross over, so that means the proportionality will not hold, and also this will indicate there's an interaction between time and the survival, and, and I'm sorry, and the uh, uh, the hazard uh, between the two groups, and then the proportionality assumption in the cost model will not hold. Right. And as I said, the key assumption here is the proportionality of cross groups defined by the exposure or the uh, covariate status. So treatment is one uh, situation of exposure at least of zero and one. And basically, the data uh, you can use for the Cox model is three key parts. So one is the uh, event uh, time, Si. So this is a minimum of Ti and Ci. Um, the other one is the indicator functions. So we we'll always need a function with a zero and one. So zero means uh, you observe a sensor in time, and one indicator you use a uh, uh, event time. And then all the other part we call zi part. So the zi can be either uh, exp uh, exposure, the main exposure, uh, or can be uh, other kind of variable, the con con confounding variables, or can be the uh, uh, the covariates or factors or or whatever type. Um, so the most commonly used type of Z is this one dimensional scalar. Um, so the assumption is conditional on the covariance being observed. Um, and the T, the event time, and the C, the sensing time are independent of each other. So they're not correlated. That means the sensing time is actually not dependent on the survival time or the event time. So if they are uh, so if they are not uh, independent or correlated, this is called informative censoring. So it means the censoring distribution is not independent. The censoring distribution is actually conditional on the uh, T, the, uh, the event time. So that would be a special topic in survival analysis called the censoring or informative censoring. And you can see the censoring it is similar to a missing data problem because you're missing, basically missing the information of either TI if you observe a CI, or you can be a missing data of CI if you observe a TI. Okay, I'll quickly go over this uh, estimation. Uh, so estimation is basically sort of the log of likelihood. And the log of likelihood of this survival is actually given by this likelihood function. Um, so one way to do that is proposed by uh, uh, Breslow, uh, Norm Breslow, he's one of the, my a mentor at the University of Washington. Um, and he proposed a way to get the, uh, um, the baseline estimator through the uh, uh, cumulative uh, uh, hazard, cumulative hazard lambda zero t. So this is a baseline cumulative hazard. It's given by a function like this. 
So this you can see is, is basically a function of the cumulative of the counting process. And also at a denominator, this is the, um, the product of the at the risk process times the exponential function. And you can easily see without this part, this is exactly the same as you estimate the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, right? Because the Kaplan-Meier curve is basically, you do the product when you do the update of these functions uh, from the counting process and at risk process, but the, without this part. But with this part, that will be, it means the, uh, we can do the beta estimation because we have this beta effects right there uh, based on the Z values. Right, and the COGS in 1972 actually in their paper proposing this um, um, uh, regression, uh, they proposed partial likelihood. Um, and this is in their 1972 paper. So basically the likelihood is not a full likelihood, it's a partial likelihood because they uh, assume um, if the hazard ratio is there, they can cancel out the baseline hazard. Uh, so what left over is all this e to an exponential beta. So they basically can base on that part of the likelihood to estimate the beta. Um, so another method, uh, which I found is more meaningful, what we easily get the estimate is called is quasi-partial quasi scoring. So the estimate for that is we can use the, uh, the equation for beta in terms of the uh, survival function uh, in terms of this, this part. Um, and then you will use a, a, a martingale or sorry, a martingale theory to get the estimation of this uh, this beta through the uh, through the uh, uh, integration of that. All right, so I will now just go all the way through very detail of this test because it's a very it's way out of range of this class. Um, but I just give you an idea. So if you're interested in knowing more details, you will have. You know where to go, um, where to get this. Uh, at least you know the name and the details of how to estimate this. All right. So next part is going to show this by an example. So the example here we got the uh, heart attack. Uh, actually, I got the. Uh, this is actually a type. It's not a heart attack. It's just heart attack. Um, I should update that. Um, at the head of the heading later. So this is basically uh, analysis using SAS um, data. And the uh, data being proposed uh, is LAC11.SAS. So this is a SAS format data which include 500 subjects of the, of the Worcester heart attack study. So this is, a, this is a study very similar to the, uh, the Farmington. And Worcester is closer to Farmington, Massachusetts. Um, and they do this similar study. The, the Farmington study is a, a very famous study for cardiovascular, uh, sort of cardiovascular disease. Um, and here the study examines several factors such as uh, age, gender, and BMI, and that may influence the survival time after the heart attack. Um, and follow-up time for all these subjects being at the time of hospital admission. So that's the time zero after the heart attack and also ends with the death or loss of follow-up and then it's defined as the sensory okay um, so that will be an event loss of follow-up is a sensory or the other kind of sensory could be that administrative sensory uh, which is that people didn't die at the end of the fall um, and there are the variables in the data set the first one is the uh, follow-up time what we call it the sensory event time is the lens of follow-up. So remember, lens of follow-up is not equal to lens of event. So this is a combination of the event time and sensory time. So this is the XI um, as we used in, in the previous lectures. I'm sorry, in the previous slides. Um, and this terminate either by the death of sensory. Uh, so we call this a sensory event time. And this F stat is the delta. Uh, the notation we use for delta. Um, that is a sensory variable, loss of follow-up equal to zero. So that means no matter it's a sensory due to a loss of follow-up or it's admin sensory, you will see zero for that variable. 
And if it's a death event, then this is equal to one. And age is the continuous variable for age at the hospitalization. And BMI, again, is also index, so continuous variable. HR is the initial heart rate. And also we have a binary variable, gender, uh, indicate the male or female, female equal to one here, and male equal to zero. All right. So the first thing we can see is we can see the cumulative distribution function f of t. So remember, this is the cumulative distribution function. It's basically just a summary of the uh, feeder time uh, or the survival time among those who have an event. And therefore, um, this is different from to look at the uh, capital mark estimate or life table estimate of the survival curve because these will not consider sensorings. And therefore, we need to tease out the sensorings from the study and describe the probability of observing a survival time or event time big T less than or equal to some time point T. The time point T is basically all the possible time point within the range uh, of follow-up. And the resulting graph here show a cumulative distribution function, what we call the CDF, plot of the length of follow-up. So this is basically to see at each follow-up time, what's the possibility, what's, what's the probability of failure? The failure is the mortality at each time point. Because at the time point, uh, as the number of time increases, as that means that follow-up time increase and increase, you will see more and more people die. And therefore, this will change from zero all the way to about 100%. So at the end uh, of the study, because it's the people with a heart attack, so we will see all of these subjects die at the end of the, uh, uh, the follow-up time. All right. Um, subjects who were death after the heart attack, so that means F stat equal to one, and then the x-axis is the length of follow-up, and the y-axis is the probability of the length of follow-up, the survival time. Um, and here you know this is the pure description of the failure time, which does not consider the sensorings. Um, and therefore, in the uh, uh, assessed procedure univariate, so remember the univariate uh, procedure can be used to do a very basic summary statistics. So what you can do is you just specify the variable equal to this um, follow-up time variable, L, E, N, F, O, L. So that's the time length of follow-up. Um, and then you need a CDF plot for that specific variable. Um, but another important part is as the procedure statement, plot univariate, you need to um, pre, you need to uh, explicitly specify the data as f stat equal to one. So that means you tease out rows with the sensory time. That means you only look at rows with event time, see how it change. All right, so if we want to do a survival function, so this is basically equal to one minus f of t, as I said. So if f of t is the probability of failure, and then s of t is the probability of still alive. And here we can describe the probability of surviving past time t, or probability the event time big t greater than the pre-specified time point t. The plot below is the survival curve of the lens of follow-up for the death subjects. So basically, we can use a procedure, uh, is a life test instead of the uh, univariate. So if we use that procedure um, and we specify the data, also we need to specify rows, F stat equal to one. So that means we'll tease out rows with sensoring time. So we'll only look at rows with an event time. Uh, and we can do a survival plot, we call it at the risk. And we specify the time. So the way in SAS to specify the time to event is you have to use the follow-up time or xi times times is the star, the delta, uh, which is f stat. And then within the parentheses, you need to specify the value which denotes the sensor time. Remember, this is not event time. SAS require you to specify in the parentheses the sensor time. 
So remember, F data have two data, zero and one. Zero is a sensor, one is event. So you have to use zero within the parentheses to say zero is the sensor time. And you have to use that fixed format to specify the time to event data. Again, that's your xi um, minimum of TNCI times the delta i, um, and then parentheses um, and the value of sensorings. So this is quite unique in SAS because most of the software like in R or in Stata, so what they, you need to uh, specify is the failure uh, indicator. So it's, a, it's using one with, with the indicator for an event, but in SAS, this is, I think it's probably only in SAS, what you need to specify is the sensor time instead of the uh, uh, event time. So once you run, you basically have this, and this is basically equal to one minus F of T. So if you use this as one of T, you use one minus of T, you plot another plot, it will be exactly the same as what you got from the procedure live test. All right, so that's for the uh, for the for the survival function part and also cumulative uh, hazard function. Cumulative, sorry, cumulative instance functions part. Um, and the next part is you can use SAS uh, again. The procedure uh, called the prog live test get this Kaplan Meyer estimate. So remember, this is quite different from the previous estimate from the S of T or F of T, because these are all based on the survival time or the event time big T. Do not consider the sensory time C. But using Kaplan Meyer, you will consider the sensory time, right? Um, so we use this PROC uh, live test. And also, we need to use this uh, uh, delta, the F stat equal to zero, tells us that the sensor in case are equal to zero. Uh, you should not put one there. You always need to put the, the value which represents sensor. Okay, and then you can use a procedure called the proc lives test and then specify the data. Here, you don't have to say this is uh, the event time because you. This Kevin Meyer will consider both event time and adjust for that sensory time. Um, and again, in the time variable, you need to have this format. Again, that's the um, sensor time to event times the sensor indicator, and then put the sensor in number, which number which denotes the sensor. All right. So basically what you got after you run this, you have a bunch of table and here I only cut at the very, uh, uh, in the front because, um, because I have a very long table because we have a 500 observations in this data set. Uh, so you have been pretty long. So if you run SAS program by yourself, you can see how long it is. But here just for the demonstration purpose, I will show like say, in the first couple of rows, you can see this survival functions always starting from 1.0 because at the beginning time zero, uh, no one had died. So the survival rate is 100%. But at later on when you follow up, like I said, at the very beginning, uh, time equal to one, you see there are one failure, and then this will be updated uh, the survival. So whenever there is a observation of, a, of event, you will update that. So if we so remember the capital marker, we need to we need to look at the uh, number of uh, uh, failures and also number of uh, uh, sensorings within the time range defined by the event time. So if there's no event time, we're not consider that time range, right? And then they like say at the time we give you the number of failures. And then they give you, like, say, at each individual, so what is the survival curve or the survival estimate, and also can give you the, the survival standard errors um, and give you the risk set. The last one is basically the, the number in the risk of set, it's the number left. Um, and this is basically the Y's, and this cumulative is basically the end, the counting of the events, is the counting of the at risk. Um, you can also calculate by yourself using the Kaplan-Meier estimate. So for example, at the time one, we have the failure. Um, we can see this total number of eight failures at the end of time one. 
in, at end of turn T, we have 16 failures. In end of turn three, we have 19 failures, for example. And then you can see within the range zero to one, you have eight failures. From one to two, you have eight. From two to three, you have three, right? It's 19 minus 16 is three. And then basically you see uh, the product. Uh, and the couple of is called the, the product, uh, the product limit estimate because it's all based on the product of the, uh, the survival. In, in the first range, you don't have a product because you only have one time range. And then you have eight failures to use a formula like that. At the uh, end of time t uh, equal to two, you have the first one times the second one. Second one, you have the eight failures. There's no censoring, so you don't have to worry about the denominators. And similar for the next time range at the end of time equal to t equal to three, you have the product of the three, um, and you have three failures. You can do something like that. So you always use the denominator as the number of risk, and and the numerator will be the uh, the number uh, at the beginning minus the number um, actually get the failure within that specific range. Um, but there happen to be no sensor. Uh, up until t equal to three. But if you run the model itself, you can see um, there's a, this is a long table you can see at the uh, at the very end or at the later time, we do see there's a sensor because whenever there's a sensor, you have a mark. So if you have a mark in that column, that means this is a sensor time instead of the uh, uh, event time. And if it's a sensor in time, you will see there's adjustment for denominator because the sensors will be teased out um, from the denominators. All right, and um, also we can do a curve. So the, the, the first thing, if you do not ask for a curve, so what you got is, is what we call the product limit survival estimate, which is a type of MAR estimate, product limit estimate uh, by tables. Sometimes this table is not very easy to understand, and, and the by and graph is easier um, and, and is more uh, straightforward um, and it's easy to understand graphically. So, if you want to do a Kaplan-Meier graph, a figure, so what you can do is you have to use this ODS graphics on. So, that means we use the two ODS in SAS and we need to put this on first. Without putting this on, SAS will not display that. Um, it still can run the curve, but it won't show um, in the um, in the view uh, section or in the result section uh, of the in the output. Um, so we need to put this on and then use the same procedure, but add the the proc life table. Uh, I'm sorry, the proc life task statement. You need to specify you want output the plot, and if you want to use the couple mark plot. The name for that is the survival parenthesis the CB. So CB will indicate this is a survival curve by using the Kaplan Meier method. Um, and then um, you have to specify the time point. Um, so here we do not, if we do not use the uh, stratified, you do not have to put the strata, strata statement here. But if you put strata statement, SAS um, will output two Kaplan Meier curve by statement. So for example, if you say strata gender, and then uh, they'll put the uh, two Kaplan Meier curve for each gender. So one for male, one for female. And after you run, you need to close that graphic tool uh, or the graphical device with the ODS graph. So this is the one without the strata. So that will be a one single Kaplan Meier curve for the entire study cohort, regardless of gender. Um, and also, this will give you a test, a log rank test for the uh, comparison of the two genders. But without the gender, this is not relevant. So only with the gender uh, comparison, so you have this uh, log rank test. Uh, so here, the log rank test was a chi-square value 7.75 and the small p-value, so which means um, we reject no hypothesis, there's no difference uh, in survival curve between male and female. And then your conclusion is there is a significant difference in survival curve between male and female in the study, in the Worcester study of uh, heart attack.
And uh, also, if you use this, uh, this command by putting a strata uh, statement, and then uh, they'll sash your output to Kaplan marker, but in the same, same panel. Um, so you have one, uh, the, the blue one, which is zero, which means that's the survival for male. And uh, the red one is the survival for female. And you can see the survival for males is systematically higher than the survival for the female. And also this will include 95% confidence interval. So basically the range, the, the whole range of this blue color is the, uh, uh, is the one with 95% confidence. And also the, the red one is the one with 95% confidence for female. And you see some of them overlap right there. But we still get a uh, uh, significant difference uh, from the log rank test. All right, um, and next one is we can, we can do this uh, uh, cost proportional hazards model. So I already give you the basic uh, in the previous uh, uh, introductions. Um, and here again, the proportional hazards model is actually we model the H. So here the H of T is basically lambda of T I used before. So the lambda of T or H of T is, uh, is the hazard at time T for specific value of the covariance. So this is a model through a baseline hazard times exponential function of the effects for the covariance. And um, we also show that we can get this hazard function, so which is basically the, the ratio of the hazard, or called hazard ratio. So this is basically equal to um, the hazard ratio times t for a specific value at x2 over the value x1 is equal to this divided by this. So it's end up to be an exponential function because the uh, uh, baseline functions cancel out. So it's end up to be exponential function of beta times uh, the difference in x2 and x1. Um, so if x is the uh, continuous variable, so this basically we can see for how many unit change was the hazard ratio. But if this x is a binary variable, so basically comparing the other level uh, with the reference level. So here we can use the uh, PROC pH rack. So the pH rack procedure is specific for proportional hazards regression. pH represents proportional hazards. So this is a procedure for a cost regression. And again, we need to use the F stat equal to zero. Uh, price is zero to tell that that sensor in cases are coded as zero in the data set. And we can use the statement called the hazard ratio. Um, and this will provide us with the estimate of the hazard ratio for an independent variable. Um, and we also can use the option units. So for example, here, we want to see the, the hazard ratio of age for five units difference. So basically, as I say, with five years different in age, what's the hazard ratio? So we can use uh, um, the uh, syntax like this units equal to five as the options within the hazard ratio state for that. Um, and again, we use this procedure and we need to specify the uh, uh, binary variable, categorical variable in this class statement. So here, because gender is a zero and one, but zero and one does not indicate a numerical meaning, it's indicated a different gender. So we need to specify that in the class statement. And then the model statement, we need to specify the survival outcome on the left-hand side of the equal sign. And this again follow the same format as we used before for all the time to event data in SAS. We need to specify this as the X times delta parenthesis indicator of censoring time. And this is equal to the, uh, on the right-hand side is the uh, predictor variable. So this is similar to a regression. So because you use the gender and age as the predictor variable or independent variable, and then you need to put them on the right-hand side of the equal sign in the model state. And there we do three hazard ratios because in the model, uh, SAS will not output the hazard ratio. Um, they will only output the beta. And remember, beta is interpreted as the log of the hazard ratio. So it's not a hazard ratio. So if you want to do a hazard ratio, you have to manually calculate them. 
um, by using exponential function uh, for different unit change for the continuous variable, uh, or use exponential function of the beta as the um, hazard ratio comparing uh, two levels in a binary data. Um, binary predictor, what that means. Um, and here we do uh, age effects, uh, sorry, gender effects. And here gender is a binary zero and one, so we don't have to put units. Uh, but if you do a continuous variable for age, so you can do units, so there's a one unit difference in the first hazard ratio. In the second hazard ratio, that we see the hazard ratio for five units change. All right, so here's the output from uh, running this proportional hazards model. So the first part is the model feed statistics. So this shows the feed statistic that can be used for the model comparisons, uh, basically for the first part. The smaller three statistics, actually the better the model feeds. So remember, this is very similar to one we talked about in the uh, logistic regression model, um, because both survival model and logistic regression model is likely to base. And therefore, the, the negative two times of the log, log, log likelihood will be important. Uh, so this is different from the uh, linear regression when we're using the least square method. So we don't care about the, uh, the likelihood there because we use the least square. I mean, unless you use the uh, likelihood based uh, for linear regression model, you can also have this uh, log likelihood, or negative two times the log likelihood in AIC and SBCs. Um, and this is only, again, for model comparison purpose. There's no meaning to interpret the value itself, um, but the smaller the value, the better the model, the compared the better the model for the prediction. So this, this is useful only if you run multiple models with a different covariance uh, predictor variables, or maybe with a different combination of this uh, predictor variable, which is meaningful. You always want to pick the one with the smallest number of uh, um, of these three uh, parameters. And the next part is the overall test of the um, chi-square. Uh, chi-square based overall test. So this overall test is basically testing the whole model um, and whether all the coefficients beta are simultaneously equal to zero. So the three p-values, so we basically use a three different uh, method to do the chi-square test. Um, but I think I already told you in the lecture number 10, we talked about logistic regression, the likelihood, likelihood ratio test, score test, and what has a, a, a very similar test with only very tiny difference there, but they're all based on the chi-square distribution. Um, so, and therefore you end up all with the chi-square value right there. And you basically need to compare this chi-square value with the chi-square distribution um, with uh, the corresponding degree of freedom and here the degree of freedom is equal to two because we have two predictor variables and each predictor variable have one degree of freedom, okay? Uh, one is the age is continuous, have one degree of freedom. And the other is the binary because we only have two, um, two groups, so it's still one degree of freedom. But if you have a categorical variable more than two levels and there will be more than one degree of freedom. All right, and then this is resolved. The p-value basically indicating that the model um, is significantly better than the null model, so the model without any predictor. Um, and so we can do this uh, partial uh, chi-square test to testing each factor. So here we have uh, two um, predictors. One is gender, the other is age. And this test can tell you that if a specific coefficient for that um, predictor variable is equal to zero, given the other independent variable in the model. So this is a similar to the uh, type three F test, but this is not for F test, this is for uh, a what test, and what test is chi-square based, um, chi-square test, because the asymptotic distribution of that is a chi-square distribution. Um, and um, the table below right here basically shows that gender is not a significant factor, because you have a p-value greater than 0.05. Um, but age is a significant factor, given the, uh, the timing is very small p-values, it's highly significant. And you can also see this from the chi-square values. Um, so it's a small chi-square value versus a, a huge chi-square value for age. So the take-home message here is basically age is important um, predictor variable, or independent variable to predict the 
um, uh, the hazard for mortality, but gender is not. There's no big difference between gender. Um, and, and this is actually um, for the uh, uh, multivariable, for the, for the multivariable model um, with both age and gender. That means you will look at gender that has to be hold age constant, but if you only see age, it has to be hold gender constant. And this is, remember we also do a, a log rank test for the gender um, by doing the comparison there. And we see that this one degree of freedom test will have a small p-value, 0.005, so which means they are different. But here, the difference between this and the one in the cost model is this is not adjusted for age, but here is adjusted for age. So if, if age is also included right there, um, the significance of gender uh, will no longer exist. All right, and the next one is the key part is, is basically the interpretation uh, for the results from the Cox proportional hazards model. Um, and uh, you always get the, the first table like this called analysis of maximum likelihood estimates. Um, again, because all of this estimate is based on the maximum likelihood estimate because, uh, because the whole model is likelihood based. Um, and therefore, it's called the maximum likelihood based uh, estimates. So this is similar to the solution table um, when we run a linear regression. Um, and therefore, for each of the predictor variables, it will give you the parameter estimate, we call it point estimate, and also give you the standard error estimate, um, and also a chi-square value for testing if this is equal to zero, uh, and also the p-value uh, for the result. Um, and they also give you the hazard ratio, and here the hazard ratio for gender is comparing female with male, and for age is the comparing the age with one unit difference, right? This will always be one unit difference. So if we want to know the five unit difference, um, you need to basically run a model with five unit change. But from the, uh, from the maximum likelihood estimate table, you only give you one unit difference of the hazard ratio. All right, and this is called a beta. And the beta will be compared with a zero, but the hazard ratio will be compared with one. All right, so this is equal to one means um, no difference. And this is equal to zero means no difference. And this is equal to zero, the parameter beta equal to zero is equivalent to the hazard ratio for that specific variable equal to one. All right, and here we basically can calculate the hazard ratio for gender. Uh, is equal to the exponential of this part, so it's equal to 1.068. And one unit change for age is equal to the exponential of this number, is equal to 1.069. But for the five unit change, so you have to use exponential five times this, so it's equal to exponential 0 0.33 equal to 1.397. So basically you can see this from the hazard ratio estimate. And the hazard ratio estimate not only give you the hazard ratio, but also give you the 95% confidence interval based on the wall test. Um, so, so no matter for the five unit chain for age, for one unit chain for age, you also have this confidence interval. And also for gender comparing male with female, so you have the confidence interval from 0.8 to 1.4, which included one, and therefore this is not significant uh, for that part. All right. And then the last one is we can uh, get the survival estimate after the model theory. So remember, this is not the same as the Kaplan Meier estimate. So the Kaplan Meier estimate is not based on the Cox proportional hazards model is use the Kaplan Meier method to directly calculate the estimate of survival. But if we got use the plot equal to survival in the plot pH rag, so this plot will be a survival plot after we fit in the proportional hazards model. Um, so that basically means we use the predictive value based on the proportional hazards model to get the estimate of the survival curve. 
So this basically need us to specify a plot. Um, so in the plot, we need the plot option in the plot PHREC statement. So right after you specify the data resource, you need to say plus equal to survival. Um, and then you basically run the same model, um, the same categorical variable in the same model with the same predictors. Um, and again, you need to open the graphic tool before you get the, uh, you got the plot and close it after, the, uh, after that. Um, and, and then this is the uh, survival function for the reference setting. And it's basically the one you fit, you actually, the, the curve you got after you fit a previous proportional hazards model. All right, so that's all for the, uh, the demonstration. In, in here, we're basically showing you, you can use the uh, procedure or either univariate uh, procedure or a live test procedure to get the distribution estimate only for rows with event time without censoring, that means. Or you can get a Kappa-Meyer estimate and you can also get a log rank test. Uh, after the Kappa-Meyer uh, estimate. And also you can use a Cox proportional hazards model, basically in SAS it's called a PROG PHREG. Uh, it's a short name for proportional hazards model uh, regression. You can use that procedure to run a Cox model and use the um, um, different functions and then different statements. You can you get an estimate of the uh, a parameter and you so you can get a hazards ratio for a flexible number of units for continuous variable um, and you can get the hazards ratio for binary variable and then um, lastly you can get this survival estimate after you see them up all right so here's the summary of this um, lecture so from this section, what I want you to know is the basic of the time to event data. And I basically show this in a graphical display. So what the test sensor means. So how come we can get the observations and of the minimum of the survival and the uh, minimum of the event and sensor time and indicator of sensor and event time. Um, and this, uh, from this, we cannot uniquely specify the um, sensoring time and event time, but from the sensoring event time, you can uniquely specify the X and the delta. But from delta to X, you won't be able to get the T and C. Um, and you need to know the descriptive of the survival function using Kaplan Meyer. And the idea of the Kaplan Meyer um, is basically within the range of uh, uh, defined by this event time. You basically count the number of um, um, events and also the number of sensorings and get the uh, basically get the update using the product of the uh, survival function to get a more accurate estimate of the survival up until a certain time point. T. Um, and the Cox proportional inheritance model, um, so why don't you know is the overall test uh, based on the chi square test, also the chi square test for each independent variables in the model. And also the chi squared partial chi squared test for each degree of freedom in the model, and also the interpretation for each parameter in the model in terms of the hazard ratio. And this is all for the uh, um, survival analysis. And this topic is actually optional; it's not included in the textbook. But but I think this is a, because it's an important part, especially for the biostatistics survival analysis is uh, is like a unique or like a special topic you have to know. Um, but there is a specific uh, um, class called survival analysis in the department, uh, so which uh, also can be offered in the. Uh, um, in the fall semester, um, I'm sorry, in the spring semester. Um, and also, uh, I'm not going to talk about repeating measurements. So that is the topic in another class of mine, um, which is a PHS uh, 6056, which is the, um, uh, we call longitudinal data analysis. So it's basically analysis for rows data. It's a repeating measurement. So repeating measurements kind of, uh, um, uh, longitudinal data, but with the co correlation 
of the repeating measurements within each subject. All right, so this is basically all for the lectures in this semester. Um, and in the next class, uh, we're going to um, do the presentation. Um, and um, that's all, Hope for, hopefully I think this, because uh, most of the uh, lectures in the semester are actually doing online or doing remotely. But I hope you can still learn a lot um, in case you have any questions, you can feel free to let me know or ask me. All right, so that's all for this lecture today.